We're currently on the cusp of a new console generation, and as players start to look back at the gaming industry's last decade, there are bound to be mixed feelings. We've been gifted with some truly phenomenal experiences, but at the same time, players have also seen the emergence of some really damaging trends. Microtransactions, season passes, and as-a-service models are but a few of the worst offenders, while loot boxes, annualized releases, and more were all popularized over the last decade. Some of these trends are finally on their way out, but that still doesn't take away from the feeling that, for every step the industry took forward in recent years, it's taken two back. And it's with that in mind that it's worth considering how these trends actually began. They all had to come from somewhere, and in some cases, the actual source of the outbreak, as it were, is genuinely quite unexpected. No genre is spared either. Single player, multiplayer, all have had a hand in fashioning the trends most players today simply cannot stand. So, in the spirit of being a miserable prick, I'm Ewan, this is What Culture Gaming, and here are 8 video games you didn't realize broke the industry. Number 8. DayZ – Popularized Battle Royale Okay, so getting the obvious thing out of the way first, I know there are tons of people who love Battle Royale. It wouldn't be the most popular thing on the planet right now if there weren't, and it's inevitable that video game publishers will react to supply the demand generated by free-to-play titles like Fortnite, PUBG, and now Apex Legends. People can enjoy whatever they want, and that's perfectly fine. If you don't like Battle Royale, then you can go play whatever you want, to a degree. You see, the major problem with Battle Royale is that it encroaches into different franchises. Take Battle Battlefield and Call of Duty, for instance. Both series made a name for themselves by providing two very different kinds of first-person shooter experiences. Battlefield with large-scale frenetic combat, and Call of Duty with fast-paced close-quarters action. Now, the two most recent releases from both franchises dedicated large chunks of time to fashioning Battle Royale experiences, seemingly determined to capitalize on the latest trend at the expense of their staple game modes and their most faithful players. Black Ops 4 didn't even have a single player, come on. In terms of games that should be blamed for making Battle Royale a thing, Fortnite is most obvious. It started out as a co-op building thing, and then pivoted to BR as soon as PUBG was developing mainstream appeal. It wasn't the first, though. That honor actually goes to DayZ, a mod for Armor 2 that formally released in 2013. Yes, there was a Hunger Games mod for Minecraft that released a year earlier, but the tropes we most commonly associate with Battle Royale, those being military combat, hiding in bushes, etc., started with DayZ. Number 7. Minecraft – Open the Floodgates to Early Access there's been a lot of controversy surrounding early access games over the last few years. Players who invest in early access titles do so with the risk that the game they're investing in may never be fully developed, while there have been repeat cases of early access titles amounting to little more than scams. The practice itself isn't inherently good or bad, and for indie developers who don't have budgets to hire playtesters, having a title be early access can actually prove invaluable. It's a great feature to have when used appropriately, but there have been cases where games have stayed in early access for years upon years upon years. No less frustrating is the fact that big publishers have also dabbled in early access, offering players unique benefits while they effectively pay for the pleasure of playtesting a title. Numerous games have adopted the feature, but by far the most notable example was Minecraft. The game is beloved by mostly all, and kickstarted gaming's early access obsession, opening the door not only for indie devs to secure greater funding and feedback for their projects, but sadly altered the prospect that players could be taken advantage of by a duplicitous studio or individual. Some games have spent actual years in early access, and it means that some have effectively forked over their money to play something that will never be finished. Number 6. SOCOM US Navy SEALs Fireteam Bravo 3 – Introduced Online Passes Online passes were a relatively brief phenomenon, but they were everywhere for a time during the seventh generation of consoles. Effectively designed to kill the second-hand market, these passes made it so that every sealed game would come with a code that would give the player access to online features. Without the code, they couldn't go on multiplayer, which meant they'd have to buy the pass for an additional fee through Xbox Live or the PSN. Online passes faced an immediate backlash upon their introduction, but publishers persisted with their use until the seventh gen ended. Ubisoft and EA were the keenest adopters, with titles like Assassin's Creed and Dragon Age both featuring online passes across a number of different entries. For all that, UB and EA were the worst offenders when it came to online passes, they weren't the companies responsible for their initial introduction. In actual fact, it was Sony's exclusive SOCOM series that was the first game to have an online pass, with PSP exclusive Fireteam Bravo 3 requiring a $20 fee for players to get online had they acquired the game secondhand. Number 5. LA Noir came with the first season pass. 
Despite a few mechanical hiccups, LA Noir is an absolute banger of a single player video game. Team Bondi's title brought the detective genre to the mainstream of the medium and did so with aplomb, garnering praise for its strong performances, revolutionary facial capture technology, and for its immaculate historical attention to detail. However, while LA Noir is still fondly remembered by most players, it hides a sinister secret. Sort of like protagonist Cole Phelps, who was of course revealed to be a mad shagger during the game's final act. As most will know by now, LA Noir had a few DLC cases that released after the game's official launch. They pad out each of the various desks Cole works his way through over the course of the game, those being traffic, homicide, vice, and arson. And while they integrate into the title fairly seamlessly if you find yourself playing the Game of the Year edition, at the time of release, it felt kind of obtuse. This was mainly down to the fact that Rockstar's then latest IP was promising a season pass ahead of release, which would give players access to all the post-launch content at a discounted price. Other publishers would soon adopt the practice, demanding players fork over money for content they weren't even guaranteed to receive in the first place, and sometimes for add-ons they knew nothing about. Now, devs take to E3 and expect a pat on the back for not including season passes. That's how bad and prevalent they were. Number 4. Titanfall kickstarted the trend of studios dropping FPS campaigns. It pains me to dunk on Respawn when they're one of the best studios around, but it's a sad reality that Titanfall kickstarted the trend of studios foregoing single player campaigns in their first person shooters. Firstly, there's nothing wrong with multiplayer only titles. In fact, for a franchise like Titanfall, the first game not having single player actually made a degree of sense. Respawn were the new kids on the block, and they were aiming to provide a true competitor to heavyweight franchises like Halo and Call of Duty, two games famed more so, debatably, for their multiplayer than their single player. They even returned to Titanfall a few years later to deliver one of the best FPS campaigns in the sequel, so they're clearly not at fault here. The issue, really, is that publishers looked at Titanfall and later Overwatch and believed they could get away with releasing an FPS without a single player altogether, even in franchises with pre-established and well-liked single player story modes. 2015 Star Wars Battlefront reboot was the first notable offender, being sold at full price by EA despite possessing a dearth of content at launch and advertising a £40 season pass for players to receive all the post-release DLC. Following in Battlefront's footsteps, Activision released 2018's Black Ops 4 without a campaign 2, opting to implement a Battle Royale mode at its expense. Even if both COD and Battlefront brought back single-player modes and subsequent entries, I don't think anyone can deny that FPS campaigns have declined in value over the last decade, at least in those franchises that have a strong multiplayer component. The challenge is rarely ever there, and they feel more like an afterthought than anything else, a result of games ditching single-player for a brief time and publishers struggling to monetize offline experiences post-launch. Number 3. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time Invented Pre-Order Culture Pre-order bonuses are naff. Like, really, really naff. Look, we've all been there, okay? Pining over the next release in the Batman Arkham franchise, only to realize that the costumes you're after, the kind of thing that would usually be unlocked in-game, by the way, are locked behind separate pre-order bonuses at different retailers. It's the hinks. And while it's a nice enough thought to reward your most loyal customers, there comes a point where it gets too much. Whether it's charging folks stupid money to steadily amass a collection of tat or some other gimmicky nonsense, pre-order bonuses ruin any sense of progression and put up paywalls in front of content that should, ideally, just be included in the base game itself. What game kickstarted pre-order bonuses, I hear you ask? Shockingly, this one is one of the hardest to nail down. Pre-ordering games really took off at the start of the late 90s and early noughties, and it was around this time that retailers and publishers came together to offer specific pre-order bonuses. It's impossible to say with any degree of certainty which game was the first, but surprisingly, it seems as though Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was one of the first, or at least the first to really popularize the trend of each game coming with a compulsory tat edition to clear up your work desk. Not North American players who pre-ordered Ocarina of Time in 1998 would get a special t-shirt and an equally special box, which had a plastic card. Is it the real culprit behind the tap renaissance? Possibly. Either way, down with the tap. Unless you want a weird bag with your pre-order of Fallout 76, in which case I won't judge. I mean, I will judge, but not vocally. Number 2. Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion The first major console release to have microtransactions Microtransactions are okay in small doses, but we've seen publishers utilize them in increasingly sinister ways over the last decade. Pay-to-win models pervaded the last console generation, while games like FIFA and Fortnite have drawn intense criticism for including what some consumers have called predatory monetization models geared primarily towards children. As most will know, it was mobile free-to-play games that really pioneered microtransactions in the industry. Freemium games are the biggest of being 
free to play but with a huge asterisk, thanks to almost every aspect of those titles, including microtransactions in some form or another. Certain titles popularized those elements on PC and consoles over the last few years, but potentially the first to actually implement microtransactions in a significant way was Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Earlier PC games would allow players to exchange real cash or fake currency a la GTA Online, but Oblivion was where it all really kicked off. Following Microsoft's attempts at including microtransactions in franchises like Perfect Dark Zero and Project Gotham Racing, Bethesda followed suit and put them in Elder Scrolls, allowing players to add armor to their horse for the low, low price of $2.50. This kind of offer has since become the norm for most games, with cosmetics and sometimes weapons with unique advantages being made available for purchase. And number 1. Team Fortress 2 – The first major title to make loot boxes a thing of all the most reviled gaming trends, loot boxes are right on up there with the worst of the worst. They were popularized through titles like Overwatch and went on to be included in dozens of multiplayer games, most controversially in 2017 Star Wars Battlefront 2. Although that game has since mounted an incredible comeback, the initial controversy surrounding its launch hasn't exactly left it with too many admirers in the long run. But where did this all begin? Loot boxes didn't just materialize out of thin air halfway through the last decade, but their origins seem almost nebulous. One day they were there, the next, they were everywhere. So where did it all begin? The earliest noted example of loot boxes in a full video game came in Chinese MMO ZT Online, which introduced the feature to ensure the game had a form of monetization in the long run. That game released in 2007, but it wasn't until 2010 when loot boxes would appear in Western markets, courtesy of industry good guys Valve. Team Fortress 2 was the game responsible, allowing players to purchase randomized crates with keys, which could be purchased with real-world currency. The rest, as they say, is history. Studios began to adopt the model, and controversy soon followed, with some governments ruling that loot boxes were effectively gambling. In fact, if you try playing Team Fortress 2 in Belgium, you get a little message saying you can't actually buy those loot boxes. And that, everyone, was our list. Know of any other video games that harbor a terrible secret? Let me know down in the comments below, and please don't forget to like and subscribe. You can find more stuff like this on whatculture.com forward slash gaming, more of me on Twitter at you and ruins things, and yeah, I'll see you next time. Bye!